Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Beat the Big Guys. I'm your host, Sandy Rosenthal. And today I have a guest from the same town that I live in, the great town of New Orleans. And his name is Rob Verchick. Hey, Rob. Hi, how you doing? I'm wonderful. Thank you. It, it's so wonderful to have you. I feel uh, gratified and grateful to have you on my guest because I know um, it's my understanding that your book, which we're going to be talking about, has already sold out of its first printing, and it's only been out what a couple of weeks. Well, yeah, yeah, that's true. So I'm very happy about that. Yeah, it struck a nerve, I think. Well, thank you so much for making time to talk to me. And uh, the book that we'll be talking about is "The Octopus in the Parking Garage: A Call for Climate Resilience." And we'll be talking all about that in just a few minutes. But first, I'd like to tell tell you all a little bit more about my guest today. Okay, g give me just a minute, Rob, and I'll be right back to you. Rob Verchick is one of the nation's leading scholars in disaster and climate change law and a former EPA official in the Obama administration. He holds the Goche St. Martin Eminent Scholar Chair in Environmental Law at Loyola University, New Orleans. Professor Verchick is also a senior fellow in disaster resilience at Tulane University and the president of the Center for Progressive Reform. That's a research and advocacy organization that advocates for solutions to our most pressing societal challenges. Rob has written more than 60 articles and four books, including the award-winning Facing Catastrophe, Environmental Action for a Post-Katrina World, which I have also read and reviewed, in addition to the book we'll be discussing today. Rob, who grew up in the sun-scorched Las Vegas desert and survived the levee breaches of Hurricane Katrina, is a resident of New Orleans and has spent a career studying environmental resilience across the country. So welcome, Rob. So good to have you with us today. Yeah, this is exciting. Thank you. You know, um, your book, uh, Octopus in the Parking Garage, took me for what I would call a ride. I, I mean, first we were in Alaska, um, and then, then we're in India, and then we're, boom, we're to the bayous of Louisiana, and then to Belize, and then to Joshua Park in California. I, I really enjoyed that. I really enjoyed it. I felt like... <coughs> I felt like um, I was with you going all over the world, uh, experiencing these amazing uh, journeys that you were taking because your description made me feel like I was there. You're a great writer, Rob. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Well, you're welcome. So I'm going to go ahead and turn the proverbial mic over to you and, uh, and you can talk to our listeners about what brought you to the point where you wrote Octopus in the Parking Garage and what you and why you think. Uh, our readers uh, and why you think our listeners should get a copy. Well, well, this book and my adventure starts with an octopus that really was in a parking garage. Um, and so that happened around in 2016. And uh, I, I got news because a friend of mine and another professor at Berkeley had actually uh, sent me a, a story about this, but it turns out that, that uh, in, in Miami in 2016 and a, uh, uh, condominium complex right on Biscayne Bay in Miami. Uh, there was a parking garage, you know, connected to that uh, condominium complex. And then a man named uh, Richard Conlon actually uh, was residing there. And he went into the parking garage to get his car one morning. And uh, instead of, you know, dry asphalt, there was a lagoon of water uh, stretching across the entire parking lot. And then when he started to look very carefully he heard, uh, he saw a gurgling bubble, and then he saw these uh, rubbery limbs kind of flipping and flopping out of the water. And it really was, it was this giant, it was an octopus, you know, size of an extra large pizza. And uh, they, they got it out of there and put it in a bucket with salt water and so on, and it was fine. Um, but uh, I started looking into this, and actually it was a story about climate change. Uh, you know, what had happened is there was a a drain, a storm drain that went from the garage parking lot all the way down to Biscayne Bay. And normally um, the opening of that drain is above the water line, uh, but because of an extreme tide and because of complications related to sea level rise, um, the water flushed the wrong way and burped up uh, an octopus into the garage. And I said to my friend at the time, I said, well, my gosh, if, if we can't keep 
sea life out of out of parking garages, what else are we not going to be able to do uh, when climate impacts uh, really, really begin to happen? And so I, I have actually, as, as you know, I mean, we, we've we been on this journey together in many ways, uh, you know, investigating floods and, uh, and other uh, sorts of um, disasters of one kind or another. I've been very interested in climate resilience since Hurricane Katrina. And um, in fact, I worked in the Obama administration at EPA for a few years, uh, you know, helping to design policies for preparing for climate change. And um, and I knew I wanted to write a book like like this, which is to say a book that's about preparing for climate change intended for ordinary readers, uh, non-experts. And I thought that if I was going to do a good job with that, I would have to explore places that I personally had a relationship to and that, and that I care a lot about. So there is a little bit of globetrotting, I guess, if you want to say in the book. Um, but I started with places that I knew very well and was already in love with. And so I grew up, as you say, in Las Vegas uh, on the Mojave Desert. And so I, one of the first things I did is I went hiking again in Joshua Tree National Park, where Joshua trees uh, are in danger of, of, um, of not being able to survive in that park on account of climate change. And um, so I, I packed in the, you know, backpacked and camped in the back country, talked to scientists there, um, went into areas where the, where the uh, Joshua tree were still uh, beautiful and, and robust and and wrote about you know basically the issues having to do with federal lands uh, you know federal government owns a third of the country and um all of the forests and wetlands and everything else and so ma many of them are are really on the ropes because of climate change uh i love new orleans i take my students kayaking into the bayous every semester we learn about river diversions and the, the largest uh, coastal restoration project in the world is under um is is undergoing change here and uh, we've got scientists from all over the world that my students talk to. So I wanted to write about that. Um, I love to um, uh, I, I love to kayak, as I just said. And so in Washington State, I, I spend the summers there and I often kayak. And the last time I was kayaking there was during forest fires. And it was like completely black and orange with smoke. And so I, I wrote about it from that point of view, the air pollution issues. My uh, father-in-law is right now, he's 97 years old. And when he's out in that area, he has to stay inside for a whole week um, because the the smoke is too thick. Um, so it's issues like that. It's not meant to be scary, but it's really very serious. And um, and one of the messages I have is that we, we all love places and things, you know, particularly things we care about or like to do, almost all of those places and things are going to be affected by climate change if they're not already. And uh, we need to think about how to adapt to that, about how to prepare ourselves for that and our kids, because we can still enjoy the outdoors. We can still have thriving, meaningful lives uh, in, in our communities. Uh, but it's not just going to happen. It's going to be our responsibility. And the first thing we need to do is learn how to build climate resilience. Well, I really did feel like your book was not scary and frightening. I wasn't frightened. Mm -hmm. um, I, 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 when I finished the book, I felt like um, I think one of your, your your last lines, page 217, hope is alive, but time is running short. Yes. And mm -hmm. I think that's, that's what you tried to get across. And I think you did it very, very well. But I'm going to go ahead and I'm just going to jump to what I thought was the most important thing you said in the book for me. Mm -hmm. now, now, I have um, believed in um, global warming and climate change since 1985. OK, I make it sound like Santa Claus when I say that or <laughs> believing in believe. I believed in it since 1985. Um, I read a, I read a book called um, Nature's End. And uh, that, that scared me. And I've been uh, a um, I believed in climate change ever since. But one of the things that's that's that confounded me so much is, is the, the excuse or the argument that, oh, you know, climate fluctuations 
Um, the earth has been getting warmer and colder since the dawn of mankind or way before mankind. And I've never known what to say to that. I've never known how to respond to that because I know that that's true. Um, so what you, what you said today, what well, this is on page, I mean, in your book, on mm. page 21 and 22, what we see today is very different from the climatic oscillations of the distant past. The slow motion roller coaster that clattered along for 6 million years. Okay. That's what the, those naysayers are saying. Our crisis right now is happening in the blink of an eye from the standpoint of a paleo anthropologist. To me, that was the big, that was the, the, the um, not the argument so much as that was key. You know, people don't understand that. I, I, I didn't. I, I know a lot about, about the problems we're experiencing right now. I drive an electric car. I'm doing what I can. Uh, but I didn't really understand just how rapidly I knew it was happening fast. I didn't know it was that fast. Yeah, it's uh, well, in the last hundred years, the sea has risen one foot, um, which which you might think is is pretty fast. Mm -hmm. um, but I'm here to tell you and, and the folks in the federal government are here, here to tell you that in the next 30 years, it's going to rise another foot. So a foot in 30 years. And then by the end of the century, we're looking at, uh, I mean, it's so hard to know, but the range is two feet to seven feet on top of that. And so um, that's a lot. Um, it, you know, now I actually have a chapter in the book that, that I really loved writing because, it, it, and it was actually about this six million year journey of humans and early humans um, who did actually, you know, we took over the world and, and we adapted um, genetically we adapted um, to different climates in part because of these uh, oscillations, you know, that, that paleontologists write about that happened over 6 million years. And one of the things I found really interesting is, is, is a lot of the things that we think of as hallmarks of the human species are, 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 are factors or characteristics that we adapted um, because of because of this slower climate change. So for instance, we're very social animals. Uh, our language, our culture, um, our uh, ability to see cause and effect, all of these things helped us live in very inhospitable places. And um, and our big brains uh, came in the last million years. And that was a time when the planet was undergoing a lot of climate oscillation. Um, so in one way, we're evolved to face this. I mean, culturally, we can change our culture very fast when we need to. We have examples of that in, in past history. Uh, but the problem, you know, kind of the irony is that it's our big brains that got us into this trouble to begin with, because we wouldn't have been exploiting the planet and and putting all uh, this carbon pollution up in the atmosphere if if we weren't so good at um, at building things and also fooling ourselves. That's another part of what our brains do. Yeah, that was an interesting part of the book, and uh, which was really more in the beginning of the book, which I think is important. Uh, there's something else I learned, which I didn't really understand before, but I definitely understand it now, is this, um, the, 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 the earth heating up, uh, you, you call it thermal inertia. And what that means is that while the earth can heat up very quickly, it doesn't cool off as quickly. And you come and you talked about the physics of that. So yeah, that's right. And and the reason that's important, I, I think, for uh, for ordinary people, right, interested in this, is there there used to be not so much anymore, but in the environmental community, there used to be this debate about whether we should try to lower greenhouse gases or should we try to just adapt to climate change. And uh, some folks didn't like talking about adapting to climate change because they 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 thought that you know it's job one to reduce carbon pollution well it is job one to reduce carbon pollution it's also job one to adapt to climate change and the reason is that even if you could just stop the consumption of fossil fuel tomorrow all over the planet we'd still have at least a hundred years worth of warming baked into the system and and part of that is just exactly like you say you heat up a um a pot of water, you turn the flame off, that doesn't mean the water's cool. 
uh, the water's still really hot and it takes a while for it to cool down. The other problem is, is these greenhouse gases, this carbon pollution that we put in the atmosphere, it doesn't go away instantly either. And so it, a lot of it just hangs around in the atmosphere, um, sometimes 50 to 100 years. So uh, you're going to have a whole, you're going to have generations of people living in on a on a world that is continuing to heat. And so we have to have a plan for that. And it, and it seems to me that one of the things that you're, you're trying to trying to uh, impress on us on the readers is that we, um, me and um, my generation, even if like like you said, we would have just stopped greenhouse gas emissions, we're not going to see the benefits in in our in our time. Well, and you know, yes, that is that is the truth. And I, that helps me understand the political problem of this, mm -hmm. right? Because politicians, to their credit, many of them, right, are pushing for solutions up to the climate problem. Um, they're pushing to solutions that they know are going to cause at least some people some some stress and frustration right up front. Whether it's having to, you know, move the economy to expand to a, a, a green energy or whatever it is, um, or move to different places, or or, or spend money on seawalls, wh whatever it is, right? There's going to be um, some things that we have to to put up with, and um, but no politician is going to be alive to see the um, the benefit of having reduced uh, carbon pollution. But knowing um, this is key. Knowing, it, yeah, I think it is, right? You're doing this for a sustainable uh, society. Kind of reminds me of, uh, you don't want to know that a hurricane is coming, <laughs> but you're not happy about it, but you'd rather know. Yeah. You don't yeah. want a hurricane to come to your hometown, but what, if one's coming, you want to know. And yeah, I, I often, feel... you, you, we, we were discussing, because we each have... Uh, uh, connector we each have kids who are who are now in in um northern california and and we often have this debate about would you would you rather be prone to earthquakes or floods and i always say well at least you know when a flood is coming <laughs> right and, and you'd you'd rather know yeah you'd rather know and that's the comparison i'm trying to make here is, is it's not it's not news we want to hear but it's better to know but and you know that. what the other thing though is, and this is what I I concentrated on when I was in in uh, uh, in the EPA, is that there are good things that you get soon when you make some of these changes. So, for instance, as we move our electric grid to more renewable energy, we're going to have less uh, ozone. We're going to have less smog pollution. We're going to have less mm -hmm. soot in the air. That's we are going to save, and I'm not kidding here. We're going to save over years thousands of lives by getting rid of that kind of pollution, and that that those are benefits that we will start to see uh, almost immediately. That's encouraging. Um, thank you. You brought back a memory during COVID. We could instantly see um, the benefits during COVID. Yeah, that's good. Uh, right. The, there were um, animals showing up where we've never seen them before, and and. Um, and then the, the reduction in smog. So yes, there are immediate benefits. And I really think um, it's, it's good to know both of those. It, 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 it's good to know. You know what I love? I think it's going to be a lot quieter. Can you imagine when all of your streets have electric cars and all the leaf blowers are electric? <laughs> I'm, um, I'm loving that. Me too. Me too. You've just hit me on a pet peeve leaf blowers <laughs> so there are you, you there's so many gems in your book we, we don't have time to discuss them all um but uh, this is one of my favorite gems um uh, no natural disaster happens in human communities mm. no natural disaster happens in human communities i love that and can you talk about that a little more for our listeners sure what what it means is that um what what we think of as as let's say natural disasters, whether that might be a flood from a hurricane or or whatever, um, is that there's always a social side to it. Um, that there there's there was always a decision at some point to build homes in certain areas or to build levees to certain specifications and not other specifications, uh, or there were decisions um, to uh, to not provide people information uh, about uh, about certain things, and that. 
and that and and people have written about this particularly you know sort of in the in the middle of the 20th century there was a lot of research on this that if if your main aim as a society was to make people safer from disasters um you want to protect against them i suppose but but you also want to make sure that you have living social systems um that can bounce back better that are that are resilient um it's not, uh, you know, a, a hurricane that happens in the middle of the Pacific Ocean with nobody living there is not is not a disaster. <laughs> um, it, it, it's not the force. It's the force and the exposure. And we're responsible for the exposure of, of human people uh, or humans or, or animals or whatever, uh, if they're, you know, if they're in areas uh, that, that we manage. And um, and so knowing that uh, means that government has a responsibility always to understand as well as people can what the dangers are in our social situations um and and so that means you don't allow people or encourage people let's just say to to build in places just because they're cheap even if they're going to be in flood zones or in in fire prone areas or or whatever and it also means and this is a a, a major theme in my book it also means that we have a responsibility, we government, society, whatever, we have a responsibility right. to make sure that our communities are just um, and fair. Because one of the things we know um, from the research in the United States and elsewhere is that um, it, is, it is people who are poor, people who are members of, of uh, historically uh, disadvantaged um, uh, uh, racial groups or ethnic groups, it are the it, it's these overburdened, underserved populations in our in our country that um, that are almost always damaged more uh, during times of disaster and have a harder time recovering. Uh, we have you know more people die of heat wave than just about anything else in the United States in terms of of these so called natural disasters, um, and uh, uh, African Americans and Latinos make up a much larger proportion of the deaths of um of of heat waves uh also uh, older single women are another group and um and so why is that right and part of that is that it's a social situation it's the fact that here in new orleans and in seattle where i spend time too um it is 10 degrees hotter in certain neighborhoods than others uh, and those hotter areas are usually poorer areas or areas of color that don't have as much tree cover and fountains and and uh, pools and things like that. A a and so that's part of the social vulnerability um, that we ourselves have have either created or tolerated, right? And we have to we we have to push against that. We definitely do. And toward the end of this of this interview, we're going to be talking about your suggestions on how to. Uh, face off with that challenge because which has also been getting more attention over the last 10 years mm -hmm. which is good but we'll talk all about your suggestions which I think are excellent because we have a couple more of your gems uh, that I wanted to talk about on page 160 Rob made the observation in 10 years there will be no glaciers in Glacier National Park yeah, well, uh, uh, that that's what the scientists are telling us, mm -hmm. right? It's it, it's it's. Uh, I actually, <laughs> I was talking to a woman um, who uh, is at Stanford who is experimenting with actually different kinds of powders that they can scatter on top of glaciers in hopes of keeping them wow. uh, together. Uh, and 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 you know, th this just raises this issue that I put in the book uh, too. Is is there, there's a balance between how much human beings should be intervening and whether they should be intervening. I mean, you put powder on a glacier to save it and you might screw things up, right? Even mm -hmm. even worse. And so how do you know, right? We could transplant Joshua trees into other parts of the country. Um, would that be a good idea? Would that be a bad idea? Uh, there are people who talk about putting in irrigation systems in Sequoia National Park um, so that the sequoias don't die of drought. Um, these are all... I don't have the answers for any of they're them. They're all well-meaning. They're, they're all very complicated questions, but it raises this issue of of what it means to not intervene when, mm -hmm. in fact, we've intervened in almost every part of planetary of the planetary uh, landscape. But, but two wrongs don't make a right. Uh, so I I I also I learned something that shocked the pants off of me. Mm. It made me so angry. 
because I know it's so avoidable. On page 46, you spoke about the um, something that occurred during, during Hurricane Ida, uh, and, and that is the intentionally triggered chemical releases into the air. Yeah. Intentional triggered chemical releases into the air, and then you went on to say a little later, we don't know how many pounds of pollutants um, was were just expo- sent out into the air. Well, this is my comment on that. So y- y- if I were um, sit, um, sitting on a, on a congressional panel, it would be very difficult to convince me um, that the owners of, what was the name of the, the chemical company that did this? Oh, did that was a, that a, American's Diarene was the particular. American's uh, Diarene, okay. Yeah. So if 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 I had the president of American Styling sitting in front of me, and if he were to say to me, oh, we couldn't have predicted a hurricane coming, who would have thought of that? And the reason they had to do this unintentional, I mean, this intentional triggered release was because of the conditions created by the hurricane. A which, power outage, yeah. A power outage. Oh, we never thought there'd be a power outage. Who would have thought of that? It just makes my blood boil because anything that contributes to the bottom line of the shareholders, they think of that. But anything that pollutes the environment, they they either knew about it and intentionally did nothing or really applied no resources toward it. But that makes me so angry because if they could build, if oil companies can drill at the bottom of the Gulf, and the bottom of the ocean, they ought to figure out a way to uh, a, fa- a, a, um, a a safety device, a safety prevention to not have to pump and chemically up uh, to intentionally release chemicals into the air. Yeah, S- Sandy, this is related actually to something I know that you're that you're working on right now that we talked about, which is this idea that engineers should be uh, e- e- educated from day one to think about extreme events even even events that that have a low likelihood of happening um and, and the phrase we were using was normalizing uh, rare events right uh, because think because bad things do happen although they don't even if they're not likely and and we saw this in the bp oil spill for instance you know some of the environmental reviews that the federal government accepted uh were you know bp and other actors saying well a blowout is so unlikely we're not going to uh, we're not going to talk about it because why why should we have to? Um, and and you're right about these uh, the these venting of chemicals and another issue that really is all over the country that people should know about is that a lot of these facilities are more prone to flooding now than they used to be. And I'm talking just industrial facilities that have a lot of contaminated uh, soil or a lot of contaminants on their property. And the more those places flood, the more that uh, contamination goes into surrounding na- neighborhoods, which tend to be poorer neighborhoods or, or with at least less land value. And, um, and, and you know, uh, the, the Biden administration, to its credit, is now pushing harder for companies to have better uh, what they call hazard mitigation plans. Um, that that take into consideration sea level rise and increased precipitation and all of these things, because we know these things are happening, but they still don't show up in a lot of safety plans. And that's great about the Obama administration. Um, there's a, one last thing I wanted to talk about before we move on to what do we do? Okay, How can we help? Mm-hmm. And that is um, you, you discussed coral um, and you talked about Belize. So I, uh, 25 years ago, uh, I went to uh, Belize with my family and uh, we went snorkeling out on the coral reefs, which was just mm. absolutely beautiful. Mm-hmm. And But even 25 years ago, um, uh, it was encouraging for me to remember this now, the guides were very, very insistent, don't touch the coral, look at it, don't touch it and certainly don't stand on it so this is 25 years ago so it, it the good news is is um it's not like just recently we figured out um that the, our coral is disappearing and we need to protect it but what i didn't know rob until i read your book and thank you for enlightening me um on page 183 or in that area you talked about how important coral is mm. how important it is in the world i had no idea 
Yeah, uh, uh, so much of 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 what we take for granted depends on the oceans. Uh, you know, ha half of the air that we breathe comes from the ocean. And 25% uh, of the food that we eat, in, uh, this is a global uh, statistic, 25% of the fish that we eat um, is supported in one way or another by coral. And um, and coral only makes up about 2% of the ocean floor. And so that just goes to show how how important it is. Um, the, the, the problem is, is that coral has really globally been... Um, been taken for you know it is really on the ropes it's in the intensive care unit at this point in the last 12 years we've lost 15 percent of all of our coral and uh one of the main issues with coral are ocean heat waves which are caused by uh, climate change uh, and which cause something called coral bleaching which is a a, a a terrible event that that often leads to the to the um the the killing of coral um there are there are some suggestions under by UN scientists that say that if we're not able to keep um, temperatures from rising above 1.5 degrees Celsius uh, uh, as compared to pre-industrial levels, that um, we may lose all wild coral in the world, um, which would be I, I, an insurmountable tragedy. Uh, I mean, you think of all the people who rely on on fish you know, uh, and, and sometimes free protein, particularly in developing countries and so on. Um, so what this, what this raises, that's the, that's the downside, right? That's the really scary side. Uh, what, what that raises is this issue about how you, um, how you might help the situation. And, and like most problems that we experience with climate, climate change is just one of the major stressors. There are usually other stressors too. And so in the case of coral, it's because there's a lot of land-based pollution that goes into the ocean. Uh, it's because that we we overlove coral sometimes with too much tourism or and and particularly with with the, the wrong kind of sunscreen and stuff that people wear. Um, there's overfishing, which is a huge global problem that also affects coral. And so it, 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 what I say in the book is, well, we might not be able to turn the thermostat on the ocean down anytime soon, but what we can definitely do is, is attack some of those other stressors that I talked about, overfishing, overloving, um, and, uh, and pollution. And if we did those things, there is good, there are good studies out there that show that uh, if, if you were to make room for coral to bounce back, it could. I, I was recently, um, I spent a sabbatical in French Polynesia uh, on an island called Moorea, which has two um, two marine stations, and they study coral. And it's some of the most beautiful coral in the world, very robust and healthy. It does uh, have, uh, it is subject to ocean heat waves, almost everywhere in the world is. But when you have an ocean heat wave that leads to coral bleaching in uh, in French Polynesia, it's much more likely to come back because the other stressors aren't there, uh, or, or not so many, I should say, of the other stressors. And so, you know, making room for nature to bounce back is one of our responsibilities. And and uh, the perfect segue, um, because I really wanted to close uh, with the things you discuss in your final chapters. For example, on, on page 204, you sp spoke of something called managed retreat, Mm. managed retreat and on 205 something called climate induced migration which are relate similar but not the same thing and then you gave some suggestions on, on what should we do and uh, i'd like to hand the flow of, over to you and uh and have you tell our listeners uh what should be what you think should be done well, you know, this is an issue, Sandy, that that you and I know well in the state of Louisiana because there are uh, on, in the coastal parishes, right, in the southern parishes in Louisiana, there are many communities that are relatively small. They're not protected by levees. And um, and they are absolutely uh, going to be underwater, some of them, in the next uh, in the next generation or so. And and in fact, our state is a leader in in this kind of coastal adaption where they are actually have already tried to identify the communities that that may need to to think about moving or people within these areas think about moving and they're looking for money trying to raise money from the federal government and elsewhere um, to help with voluntary 
uh, buyouts of one kind or another. This is just going to happen more and more. We're the future, you know, of of, of the coast in, in that way. Um, there are um, estimates. Uh, these are federal estimates from the federal government. There are estimates that up to 12 million people uh, will will be moving from certain locations on the coast uh, within the next uh, 50, with, within, the, within the end of the century. Um, so if you think about that, where are all these people going to be moving? Mm -hmm. um, there's studies about that too, right? Because people who move from Los Angeles tend to move to uh, a, a sort of a handful of other cities. People who move from New Orleans tend to move to a handful of other cities. And, and, and the upshot is that cities like, like um, Denver and Las Vegas and uh, Orlando and uh, and Austin, Texas, these cities are going to be seeing way more people coming in um, than they are anticipating right now. And so what I what, what I think needs to happen is that the federal government needs to recognize this. People are going to be moving no matter what. They already are, right? And um, and we know this is going to be happening. And and so we need a way. Uh, first of all, to convene these communities, the receiving communities and the communities that are going to be losing people, um, so that so that there can be some kind of um, of cooperation. I mean, most people are going to move within their own states, or certainly within the United States, right? So, so that that can be done, and then funding needs to be made uh, available to allow this kind of resorting to happen. Um, because without the funding, um, it, it's really going to be chaotic. I mean, you can think of, um, uh, you know, the, the migration after the Dust Bowl, right? That was that was one of the last times we saw a huge uh, environment-induced migration in the United States. Um, would you, and it, um, excuse me, would you yeah. um, include the... Um, what the uh, diaspora after um, Hurricane Katrina and the levee breaches? Yeah, yeah. I mean, absolutely, right. And 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 actually, the diaspora after Hurricane Maria as well. Uh, I mean, many, uh, many. I don't know what percent, uh, but a huge percent never returned home. Yeah, and it causes it causes huge stress on the communities that are losing their taxpayers, the communities that are having to open more classrooms. And so on. We saw this during the California drought. I tracked this a little bit. There were during the California drought, there were a, a lot of uh, migrant workers who were uh, in uh, Central California. All of a sudden, they can't make money in Central California the way they could. So they had to move up to Northern California or they moved up to Oregon and some of them went up to Washington. And, and while these families are doing that, they're doing it during the school year, moving their kids two or three times. Um, they're having to uh, uh, sign up for new kinds of social benefits in whatever the state is that they're in. They're enrolling their kids in new schools. They're finding new doctors. They're, I mean, just just imagine all of that. And these um, are and it, these are um, American citizens. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, you know, we we did a, a survey. We some uh, some of my colleagues did a survey looking at communities that that were uh, interested in moving as a whole. Right, because of because of climate change, and um, the federal government had counted somewhere around fifteen. I think it was um, all of them. All of them were indigenous communities. Uh, most of them in Alaska, a few in Washington State, and then one, the Ile de Jean Charles tribe in in southern Louisiana. Um, and that tells you that tells you a lot uh, about the situation uh, where. Uh, the people on our most vulnerable areas uh, to climate change are indigenous groups who, in most cases, didn't voluntarily choose the places that they're living in now. And as I mentioned earlier, fortunately, if there's some good to be seen in this, uh, attention to that travesty has grown exponentially yeah, in the past 10 has. years. Yeah. And I think in particularly because of the Ile de Jean Charles tribe, uh, which is the, the name the name they've adopted now. And um, and some of the some of the villages in in Alaska. And you know, it's interesting. I I, I talk uh, uh, and I I, I talk uh, with many of the indigenous uh, groups in Louisiana, and I and I interview uh, Chief Sherelle Parfait Dardar, uh, who is a, a tribal leader in the book. And uh, and one of the things that that I found that was so interesting is they they have uh, they the many of the indigenous communities in southern Louisiana. 
um, have regular workshops by Zoom with uh, indigenous groups in Alaska and elsewhere, uh, and sometimes island nations. And so they are all kind of working together. Uh, they, they have remarkably different landscapes, as you can imagine, um, but they have very similar uh, cultural and political issues. And so it's really interesting to see them, yes. you know, build, building. I thought I was slopes. reading. If you just changed where they were, it was the same story. Yes, it is you the same. Change the story. land under their feet. Yes, same story. Right. So, mm -hmm. so Rob, um, as you you um, as you wrote on page two seventeen, hope is alive, but time is running short. Um, you wrote an excellent book. Um, you brought this, I think, even people whose eyes were already open, our eyes are open a little bit wider to what's going on. Uh, I thought this book was fabulous. Um, and we're about running out of time. But is there anything else that you can share with our listeners today? Well, I, I, I will share this. To me, uh, this book is about hope. Um and I, I spent, a, I have, a, I have a, a, a raft of books uh, that I read about, you know, trying to think about how people get inspired, how people choose to do things. Um, and um, I, I just think that uh, hope doesn't mean that everything's going to turn out all right, but it does mean having hope does mean that as long as there's a chance that things can turn out better, we all have an opportunity, we all have um, a duty to um, to see that that happens, or to, or to push in some small way, and and I, and I think all of us are capable of that kind of hope and and working together. I really think um, we can work together as communities and as voters and as citizens uh, to hold our government to account to, and and also of course to everybody involved in climate change. Um, but I I think we can move the needle. We have time, uh, but we don't have a lot of time left, and we just need to to get going. Thank you so much, Rob. The Octopus in the Parking Garage, A Call for Climate Resilience by Rob Verchick. I highly recommend it. Uh, and um, thank you, all of you, the listeners today. Uh, we can't do this without you. The video version of this interview is available on, on my YouTube channel, Beat the Big Guys. Don't forget to write, subscribe, and rate this podcast on all of your favorite platforms. And remember, no matter who you are, you too can beat the big guys. Okay, I'm going to stop recording. Stay with me.